The federal regulatory and assistance programs created as part of the New Deal from 1933 through 1938 substantially expanded the federal government's authority over matters once considered purely local. This precipitated legal battles over federalism, which resulted in a significant shift in Commerce Clause jurisprudence. In this unit, we'll look at Commerce Clause jurisprudence prior to the New Deal. Our first case is an 1824 opinion from that great Federalist, John Marshall. The fascinating background of this case transports us back into a past era before the bridges and tunnels that now connect northeastern New Jersey with Manhattan when the most reliable way of crossing the Hudson was by steamboat. This kind of history, as you know, is why I love constitutional law. Our first major character in the story, Robert Livingston, was one of the founding fathers who had participated in the drafting of the Declaration of Independence and had administered the oath of office to George Washington. In the middle part of his career, he had served as Chancellor of New York, the highest judicial office in the state, and subsequently was always known as the Chancellor. He was appointed Minister to France by President Jefferson and negotiated the Louisiana Purchase. He was the first Grand Master of the Freemason Grand Lodge in New York, a lodge that still owns the Bible Livingston used to administer the oath of office to President Washington. In other words, Livingston was connected. Livingston obtained a monopoly on steamboat travel over New York waters from the New York legislature in 1798 after learning of the first successful test of a steamboat in Scotland. Livingston became a business partner of inventor Robert Fulton. Livingston and Fulton produced the North River Steamboat of Claremont, which made its maiden voyage in 1807. The Claremont could make the trip on the Hudson between New York City and Albany in about 35 hours, considered speedy at that time. In 1807, Livingston and Fulton obtained a 30-year extension of the exclusive steamboat franchise from the New York legislature. They tried to obtain similar monopoly franchises from other states and territories, but were generally politically unsuccessful. Remember that this was not only before the advent of automobiles, but also before the construction of major canalways or railways. Moving people and goods by sail and then by steam on major inland waterways was an enormously important part of the national economic infrastructure. The next major character in our story, Aaron Ogden, was a native of Elizabethtown, today's Elizabeth, New Jersey. He had been a Continental soldier in the Revolutionary War. He also was a lawyer and served as a New Jersey Assemblyman, a U.S. Senator from New Jersey, and as New Jersey's fifth governor. In 1811, Ogden operated a steamboat ferry called the Seahorse between Elizabethtown and New York City, running afoul of Livingston and Fulton's state monopoly. New York State courts upheld the Livingston-Fulton monopoly in litigation brought by another potential competitor. There were other possible avenues of legal challenge, but Livingston and Fulton reached deals with most other would-be competitors by selling them licenses or buying their boats. In 1815, Ogden took such a license from Livingston and Fulton. Ogden's business partner in this venture was Thomas Gibbons, a planter and lawyer from Georgia who had been a Tory during the Revolutionary War. Gibbons owned a summer house in Elizabethtown where he was a neighbor of Ogden. Yes, people had summer homes in this part of New Jersey in the early 19th century. Ogden and Gibbons' duly licensed ferry connected with a steam vessel owned by Ogden called the Bologna in Elizabethtown, which sailed further down the Raritan and other New Jersey ports. The Bologna was licensed under a federal statute enacted in 1793 before the invention of steamships, covering vessels to be licensed in the coasting trade. The Bologna did not have a license from Livingston and Fulton because it sailed only in New Jersey waters, at least until Ogden and Gibbons had a falling out. Gibbons broke away with Ogden and began sailing the Bologna all the way to New York City. The Bologna's captain was Cornelius Vanderbilt, known as the Commodore, who would be, go on to become a fa famous railway baron during the Gilded Age. Vanderbilt was skilled at concealing the Bologna's whereabouts to avoid seizure by authorities. Ogden then sued his former business partner Gibbons in New York Chancery Court, seeking an injunction to enforce the monopoly. Gibbons was represented by the famous lawyer and politician Daniel Webster. He lost in the New York courts. The case was not heard by the U.S. Supreme Court until 1824. 
By this time, the importance of steamboat travel was becoming even more apparent. Steam railways were beginning to operate in England, and the potential for steam-powered rail travel was being explored in the United States. The court, therefore, was considering the effects of local state regulation on the development of national technological infrastructure. Justice Marshall's opinion deals with two basic legal issues. First, does the word commerce in the Constitution include navigation? Second, does interstate commerce include commerce only at the borders between states, or also commerce that runs into the interior of a state? Marshall answers both of these questions in the affirmative, in favor of federal power to regulate the steamship business at issue in the case. Notice how Justice Marshall reaches this result. What kinds of interpretive tools does he use? Are you persuaded by his interpretation of the constitutional language? If Gibbons v. Ogden were the last word, it would be hard to see how any exercise of federal power over any local economic activity could violate the Commerce Clause. The meaning of the word commerce seems very flexible, and interstate can include activities that penetrate into the interior of the state. In fact, we'll see that after the New Deal, the Commerce Clause was indeed interpreted just about this expansively. But after Gibbons v. Ogden and before the New Deal cases, there were at least three main lines of cases suggesting limits on federal power to regulate commerce. Many of these cases were responses to populist legislation, such as the Sherman Antitrust Act that sought to curtail the power of large businesses during the Gilded Age, the period from the 1870s to around 1900 in which the rail and steel industries fueled a westward expansion and which also included two significant economic crises, the Panic of 1873 and the Panic of 1893. Do you see a pattern emerging here? Here's something I notice. Technological disruption, often accompanied by war, is followed by industrial consolidation. Industrial consolidation is followed by banking and economic crises. Consolidation and crises produce a wave of populism critical of the federal government. And then there is more technological disruption and or war starting a new cycle. And constitutional law federalism doctrines wax and wane along with these changes. Like any heuristic, this terribly oversimplifies history, but I think it has some descriptive power. The three main approaches to Commerce Clause jurisprudence prior to the New Deal included one, the direct versus indirect effects test, two, the substantial economic effects test, and three, the stream of commerce test. Each of these different tests represented an effort to get at the basic question of whether the federal regulation really related to interstate commerce, or whether the regulated activity was either mostly intrastate or not really commerce. I want you to read through the notes in the casebook and understand the basic outlines of these different pre-New Deal tests but don't spend too much time on them. Think of them more as a historical and jurisprudential prelude to our current debates about federalism and the Commerce Clause. To confuse things further, another stream of cases prior to the New Deal relating to federal morals or vice legislation reached inconsistent results without clearly applying any of these three tests. Jurists at the turn of the 20th century saw these as high-stakes fights over whether the Commerce Clause gave the federal government authority to regulate in areas that were traditionally thought of as the domain of state and local police powers. It has long been a principle of Anglo-American law that police power should respond to local conditions and be accountable to local oversight. Questions about whether the law should criminalize or penalize perceived vices such as gambling were usually considered local concerns. In the Federalist Papers number 17, Alexander Hamilton noted that there is one transcendent advantage belonging to the province of the state governments, which alone suffices to place the matter in a clear and satisfactory light. I mean the ordinary administration of criminal and civil justice. This, of all others, is the most powerful, most universal, and most attractive source of popular obedience and attachment. It is that which, being the immediate and visible guardian of life and property, having its benefits and its terrors in constant activity before the public eye, regulating all those personal interests and familiar concerns to which the sensibility of individuals is more immediately awake, contributes more than any other circumstance to impressing upon the minds of people affection, esteem, and reverence toward the government. Hamilton called this local police power the great cement of society, 
and argued in the Federalist No. 17 that a strong federal government was necessary to counterbalance the tendency of local police power to fragment the Union. Hamilton did not, however, suggest that the central federal government should usurp state police powers. In the Federalist No. 17, he conceived of the central federal government as exercising a higher level of coordination, which would balance, and might itself be balanced by, the more immediate influence of local police power in the state. Given this background, you might understand why the court wrestled with whether state lotteries or the transportation of prostitutes across state lines should become a matter of federal regulation under the Commerce Clause. From a contemporary perspective, the child labor case, Hammer v. Dagenhart, seems harder to understand. The majority, in an opinion written by Justice Day, saw the statute at issue which barred the interstate transport of goods made with child labor as a naked effort to regulate working conditions, a concern traditionally within the domain of local state police power by regulating prices, a concern traditionally within the domain of markets. The dissent, written by Justice Holmes, argued the statute only affected interstate transport, echoing the theme of Gibbons v. Ogden, and otherwise said nothing about what local working conditions a state might or might not permit. Looking back on Hammer v. Dagenhart, we're horrified at an era in which hard child labor was common and legal through most of the United States. As we move into the New Deal era cases in Unit 4, you'll see that federal labor legislation was one of the main initiatives of the New Deal and one of the main drivers of a much more expansive interpretation of federal authority under the Commerce Clause. You'll also see when we discuss civil rights and substantive due process under the 14th Amendment next semester that parallel battles were occurring over whether the federal constitution limited progressive state governments from enacting labor laws. In Lochner v. New York, an infamous 1905 case we'll look at next semester, the court held that a New York statute setting maximum working hours violated the 14th Amendment rights of a local bakery and its employees to freely enter into contracts to work longer hours. This view of economic liberties under the 14th Amendment was abandoned by the court in the New Deal era. As a result of New Deal era cases then, the federal government could regulate labor and market conditions under the Commerce Clause, and progressive state governments could also regulate labor and market conditions without violating the 14th Amendment. At the same time, again, as we'll see next semester, starting in the Civil Rights era in the 1950s, the court began to read the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses of the 14th Amendment more broadly as restrictions against both state and federal laws that encoded racial or gender discrimination or that regulated sexual conduct. This is part of what makes contemporary fights over federalism complicated, if not sometimes seemingly incoherent. Conservatives say that they want a smaller central government but they're happy with broad federal legislation that regulates what they consider moral issues, such as abortion or the definition of marriage. Liberals suggest a much broader role for the federal government in the economic area, but adopt a basically libertarian anti-government posture when it comes to morals legislation. In the end, these differences may reflect principal disagreements about the proper interpretation of different parts of the Constitution in relation to federalism concerns, or they may reflect mere political preferences dressed up after the fact in constitutional doctrine, or perhaps a bit of both. In any event, for now, try to get a feel for how the court viewed the Commerce Clause before the New Deal in both economic and morals cases. We'll discuss all of this when we meet together in person, and then in the next unit, we'll move through the Commerce Clause jurisprudence through the New Deal and into the present including revisiting our discussion of how these issues played out in the Obamacare case.